Has anyone actually heard my experience? Has anyone ever heard it? Um, three of you. Oh, four, five. Well, you've all heard it, so we ah. should do something else. <laughs> no. <laughs> Second hand. Um, so I think I'll try and share it as best I can, and then if you have questions or you know, I mean, prayer needs or prayer requests, that'd be great. Um, born and bred in New Zealand. And my outdoor passion, I think I had Viking blood in me. I spent more time in the water, under the water, or on it. So it was surfing, diving, fishing. My whole world was literally the ocean. Um, and I saw a movie called Endless Summer when I was surfing here in New Zealand. Um, some Californian kids did it. And they traveled trying to miss winter, which I'm sure a bunch of Canadians would be considering that about now <laughs> and so i thought new zealand winters are, are pretty mild but i wanted to just travel on an endless summer so missing winter and just surf so in 1980 i took my surfboard and one of my best friends and we just took off surfed australia indonesia uh, sri lanka and then i got on a yacht and sailed um 26 days through the indian ocean on a 96 foot schooner from Sri Lanka to Mauritius. And when I got there, I just loved it. I jumped off the boat, hung out with all the local fishermen who taught me how to night dive and we surfed with them. Became very close, almost became brothers and friends and um, ran out of money like you do when you're traveling. Went to South Africa, surfed, lived in South Africa and was about to go overland and safari up to, um, to England and then through South America. It's gonna go around the world. And I'd been traveling for two years and my brother wrote to me and said, will you come home for my wedding? I said, sure, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come back. So I changed my, my plans to go on overland, came back to an island called Reunion, surfed that, and then came back to Mauritius. And I think it was about a week out before my flight returned via Australia to New Zealand. And my friend Simon, who was a night diver, um, had taught me how to night dive the year before. Said, Ian, yeah, we're going to a very special place. Will you come tonight? And I said, yeah, sure. But when I looked at the sea, I could see a storm raging out at sea. And I was a bit concerned that the surf would come up and it would be too dangerous. And he, he convinced me, no, it's going to be fine. So we went down to a place called Rivière Noir, Black River, dropped in the ocean, started swimming. The next minute I made out this transparent, it looked like a... Um, a, a torpedo or bell shape like a normal jellyfish, but then cubed and finger-like tentacles. And I was a little bit, uh, I'd seen most um, Jacques Cousteau programs. I was an instructor in scuba. I, I knew the ocean backwards, but I'd never seen anything like this. So with my leather gloves, which we used to grab the, the lobster, the crayfish, I reached out and grabbed it and it squeezed from my hand like a jellyfish. And I thought, well, that's an unusual jellyfish. Never seen one like that before. Little did I realize it was a box jellyfish. Um, the Australians call it a sea wasp, a marine stinger, or a box jelly. The, and its toxin is supposedly the second or the most deadliest neurotoxin known to man. Um, it's killed over 100 Australians. It's more deadly than, um, uh, I think, 100 times more deadly than a cobra. So the toxin in this, if you're hit in the neck, you could be dead within three or four minutes. Hit on the extremities, most people 10, 15 minutes, slip into a coma and never come out. So it's a very, very dangerous jellyfish. Um, me, totally unaware, <laughs> had just watched one go through my, my leather gloves. I saw some crayfish, a lobster, dived down to grab them. And as I did, I got stung by some, it felt like thousands of bolts of electricity. Turned out I'd just been hit by a box jellyfish and I hadn't seen it. Um, to cut a long story short, I was hit five times across the same forearm before I could actually get into the boat to safety. There were literally thousands of them in the ocean. We'd swum into a soup of them. The, the other fishermen with me, to them, the water at night was cold. So they had full wetsuits, rubber hoods, rubber booties encased completely protected from them me unfortunately the water at night even in the tropics was like a, a warm bath i had a uh, my forearms were exposed at a short sleeve vest 
uh, what we call a long john as a wetsuit. So my face, my arms, my ankles were exposed. Um, the fishermen saw what had happened and my arm would be, I would say like Popeye, it was double its normal size. And where the tentacles had hit, it is as though you'd been physically burnt underwater. Your, my skin was blistered. You know, when you burn yourself in a stove, it can blister. Well, my whole forearm was blistered from the impact of the tentacles. The pain was excruciating. It felt like someone had put a brandy nine on my arm. I could feel the toxin hit my lymph glands. And I was having difficulty breathing, standing on the reef. The Creole fishermen, who are black Rastafarians, <laughs> they said, they looked at me and said, one of them will kill me in French. They said, on visa, pac, séphony. No, on visa, uh, séphony to you. And I said, what? And when I told them how many had hit me, they said, impossible. Uh, allez, allez, vite mon, quatre mon hospital. My French was un petit peu, but I knew enough French. You should all speak French. Lord French, <laughs> I've heard in Canada, you should just be absolutely just... <laughs> Anyhow, my French was Creole French. It was rough, and it was, <laughs> where's the surf? Where's the surf? Give me some baguettes and some vino. <laughs> so here I am. My limited French was, what? One of them will kill me. Get to the nearest hospital. It was an old British Army hospital in Katramar. I knew where it was. One of my friends, Australian guys, had dislocated his shoulder in the surf. I had to take him up there. And so I'm, I'm standing on an outer reef being told I need to get to the Victoria Hospital in Cap Trabon. And I'm going, you what? They said, urinate. Immediately pee on your arm in. It'll help nullify the, the toxin. Um, the young kid then began poling me through the lagoon towards the beach. He said, someone come with me. He said, Ian, we have no motor. Um, you must go now, you die. You die, brother. And unfortunately, none of the adult divers come with me uh, because it was just a dugout boat with a with a pole. The child who got me to shore um, hit the beach. I stood up, and to my horror, the poison had already paralyzed the right-hand side of my body, and I collapsed. The child motioned for me to put my arm around his neck. I grabbed my paralyzed right arm, and somehow this kid dragged me up a sandy coral beach. It was the middle of the night, through some um, pine trees onto the main road. I thought, well, this is there's nothing here, and this is and this is 1982. No mobile phones, no internet. Um, this is the deserted part of the uh, island, only where local fishermen live. And um, he panicked. The kids. In French, going, my frère, sur la plage, Stephanie, uh, and he wants to go back and rescue them. I said, no, ambulance, gendarme, telephone. <laughs> the kid left me and just ran down to the fishing boat to go back out to rescue the divers who didn't need rescuing because they had full wetsuits on. I'm left 10 minutes, I suppose, maybe 10 or 12 minutes into the experience, lying on the side of a, a road feeling extraordinarily tired and began to shut my eyes. As my eyes began to shut, I heard the audible voice of a man speak to me. He said, son, if you close your eyes, you shall never awake again. Startled by the man's voice, I turned in the direction to find there was no one there. Um, I thought, what the heck was that? You know, close your eyes, you'll never awake again. Well, that means dead. And I thought, what on earth are you idiot doing sleeping? You're a lifeguard. The last thing you should do is close your eyes and sleep. This is the poison. As lifeguards, you're taught to keep the patient cognitive. You're taught to keep them awake. You'd even slap them if you need to be. And so here this voice spoke to me, and I now know this to be the voice of God. But at that time, it was just complete out of my world an audible uh, voice. I thought, well, the only people to hear that are people that are in the nut house, people that have been in psych wards. But the voice seemed incredibly accurate and it just spared my life. Um, so I fought the tiredness and most people I believe would have died right there. I should have died, fallen asleep and died within 10, 15 minutes of the, of the, um, the impact. Now I know that I'm I'm on the edge of death and I must, with all my strength and energy, get to a hospital with, for neurotoxin, anti-serum. As I staggered down the road, I found three East Indian taxi drivers 
um, in Mauritius, they don't have taxi written on them, but if an Indian has a car, he will be using it as a taxi. And so I staggered towards them, and they began laughing, thinking I was drunk because they had great difficulty walking. As I leaned up against one of their vehicles, they said, are you drunk? I said, no, I've been stung by sank on visab jellyfish. Can you get me to cut through my hospital now or I'll die? And, and the the Indian man said, um, uh, we can. How much money you pay us? I'm dying. Um, I said, 50, 100 US dollars. Um, and and all three of them was trying to get me into their taxi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's interesting how money could speak. But as I said that, one of them stopped and said, um, let me let me see your money, white man. Uh, show me your money. And all three stopped. A moment silence. <laughs> I thought, well, I don't have the money on me. Obviously, I've been diving. All three Indian taxi drivers walk away. <laughs> so, I don't know if you've been in a part of the world where if you don't have money, you you could die. Um, but in this part of the world, um, you have no money, uh, you will die. Does that make sense? I, it can happen in Mauritius, it can happen in Indonesia, I've seen it in Bali, I've seen it in Thailand. You have no money, you will be left for dead. So I'm saying, well, I'm dying, please help me, completely oblivious to me asking. Then I hear this voice. I don't know if you've ever heard the voice of God audibly, but I'd never heard anything like this. I hear a man behind me say, son, are you willing to beg for your life? I thought, beg for your life. I looked around to see where this gentleman was and the invisible man. Um, I read later, I think in Isaiah, you hear a voice behind you say, walk this way. Well, I had never read a Bible. I was a complete heathen. Um, I was so far from Christianity I was on the other end of the universe of, from Christianity. So I'd been, I don't know if you've ever seen T-shirts, been there and done that. I was a total, well-practiced heathen. Uh, my world was sex and drugs and rock and roll is what my body needs. So <laughs> it has nothing to do with Christianity, nothing to do with hearing some man talking to me who could be God. And I'm hearing him say, will you beg for your life? Well, I look back at these East Indian men, of course I've never seen a white man beg. No white man begs in this part of the world. So I thought, well, what have I got to lose? What a brilliant idea. I hadn't thought of it. So I don't know if you ever beg for your life, but I fell to my knees, bowed my head like I'd seen men in Africa to do the Zulu and the, the Causa, lifted my hand, which is paralyzed, and begged for my life. As I'm pleading for my life, um, two of these East, East Indian taxi drivers must have thought I was nuts or something. They just walked away. But the younger guy, most likely shook him. He'd never seen this. He stopped, and, and I said, look, I'm serious. I'm literally dying in front of you. Please help me. I'm begging for my life. And uh, thank God for this man. Mm -hmm. This young Indian taxi driver, God bless him. Mm -hmm. uh, he walked towards me and helped me into his taxi, realizing I had no money, and he was helping me. And so we began racing down the road towards uh, the hospital, which is up on the ridge, uh, maybe a 15, 20-minute drive. He then said to me, um, white man, what, what's your hotel room number? Where do you stay so I can get my money from you that you promised? I thought, very smart taxi driver. <laughs> he, he's nice. This boy's got no flaw. He's thinking, get some payment, you know. I said, look, I'm sorry. I don't stay in a hotel. He said, but you're a tourist. Tourist stay hotel. I said, no, I live with a Creole fisherman, the Rastafarians. I said, that was the wrong answer, mate. The, and the food chain, the Creoles were the bottom of the pile. I mean, everyone kind of looked down on them. And he said, where? I said, Tamron Bay. He said, you stayed Tamron Bay Hotel. I said, no, no, I live for the Creole. Oh, my God, wrong answer again. This poor guy, he was having a bad night. He he thought he might make some dollars off me somehow. And now this guy's um, something that doesn't fit the, the equation. He got no money. <laughs> he lives with the Creole fishermen, the Rastafarians, the Bob Marley boys, you know, and... He ain't got no hotel room. He said, look, 
I not take you any further. Uh, you lie to me. You tourists, uh, I take you to the tourist hotel in Jamaran Bay. I thought, whatever, please just take me to the hospital. I'm dying, man. And and he pulls into the village where I live. Here's a small Chinese hotel on the beachfront. He said, get out. So I try and get out. Everyone in the village knows, knows me. So I thought I'll get some help. So as I try to get out, my legs, to my horror, were completely paralyzed. The neurotoxin had now taken the entire low, lower part of my body. He said, you get out. I said, I can't walk. My legs are gone. I, I pay you whatever money you want. Just give me the hospital. He leaned over, opened the door, and to my amazement, and I still don't know why he did it, he just pushed me straight out of his taxi. So his 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 his, my, his estimation of being kind and went out the window about that point. So he, he chucks me out of his car and um, shuts the door, drives off, and leaves me paralyzed in the car park of a hotel in the middle of the night. And I thought, well, if you got to die, do yourself a favor. Um, if this is how humanity treats fellow hum, hum, human beings, why don't you just die and uh, give up? But something in me, I don't know whether it's just the stubborn Irish Celtic stuff in me, thought, well, I've got one good arm. I can at least drag myself along the car park. I might as well die trying. And so as I dragged myself along the ground, um, two security guards wander out with their flashlights, wondering who, why the taxi came and who's there. And they find me in a crumpled heap on the ground. As I look up, I recognize one of the Creole security guards as my uh, drinking buddy, Danielle. I don't know if you ever got a drinking buddy, but anyhow, here I am. He says, he's a fair man. What you do on the ground? I never see you like this, Ian. Why Why you do this? And he's laughing away, thinking I'm drunk, you know, legless. And as he wanders over, his flashlight picks up my arm, which is blistered and scarred. Within a split second, he recognizes it to be what they call in French, or invisible, uh, 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 the box jellyfish. He said, pas bon, you dive with Simon de la Limo. I said, we, we. He said, yeah, this one kill you, brother. So he grabs me in his arms and um, carries me into the hotel. The Chinese who own it are sitting there and are playing uh, mahjong. I don't know if you've ever seen that game making all these noises with their checkers and whatever, drinking their black label Johnny Walker whiskey. Um, it's funny what you remember, man. <laughs> it's like, whatever. So here the Chinese are having their whiskey, playing mahjong. Everything in the world for me is kind of slowing down into a bit of a weird, surreal thing. My friend Danielle carries me and drops me in the chair next to them. And then backs off. I thought, why doesn't my Creole friend talk to the Chinese? Well, sadly, in this part of the world, there's a there's a pecking order. English, French, Chinese, Indian, Creole. If he doesn't get asked, he could lose his job by not showing respect to the owner. But I, as a white man, can speak to these Chinese owners because oh, it's just, thank God for Jesus. Thank God all that stuff's gone, mate. Mm. So I'm I'm looking at these in, these um, Chinese men who I've interrupted their mahjong game. And they said, you're drunk. What what you doing here, white man? I said, well, I've been stung by sank on bizarre jellyfish. I need to get to cut through my hospital. I'm getting sick of telling people this. But anyhow, show them my <laughs> arm. <laughs> I'm dying in front of them. One of the Chinese uh, gentlemen stands up and he said, oh, Stupid boy, why, why, why you put the needle in the arm? Uh, old men they take opium with pot. Why, 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 why you put needle in the arm? Stupid boy, and sat down. Well, I wasn't very politically correct, and I'm still not very politically correct. But in my spirit, I thought, well, thank you very much, Doctor Wong. Brilliant diagnosis, mate. This is not. Heroin. <laughs> I'm not chasing the dragon. This is from a jellyfish. But of course, I realize the Chinese don't dive. They buy the seafood off the Creoles and then sell them to the tourist hotel. I just sucked it up and thought, it's not heroin. It's not drugs. 
ignore me. Next minute, my right hand began to uh, have muscular contractions and spasms. Within seconds, my jaw is beginning to smash into it, uh, my upper jaw. My whole body goes into, I think what I can only describe as the death rattles. I'd seen a person have an epileptic fit once, and I think if you didn't know, you would think the person was having a full-scale grand seizure epileptic fit because my body was no longer in control. It was shaking, contorting, leaving the chair. Uh, and, and I thought my word would be, this is the death rattles. <laughs> my, my body was off, off the chart. They came and tried to, this stopped the Mahjong game, obviously. They came over and tried to restrain me. As they tried to restrain me, I, I was throwing them off. I was literally shaking out of control. And as soon as it started, it stopped. And I felt this um, icy cold sensation hit my feet. And in my bone marrow, I could feel a very cold death creeping into the core of my bone marrow towards my upper body. And my body went from a burning hot sensation to ice cold in a second. I said, I'm freezing. I'm freezing to death. Please help me. Please, blankets. And, and uh, the intensity of it was so overwhelming, I watched three um, hotel owners run. Within, within a few seconds, two of them had come back with blankets and were wrapping me up. Um, a third gentleman come running back with a glass of milk. I thought, why has he got a glass of milk? And he tries to pour it down my throat. I said, I don't need milk. I haven't had any serum. But of course, he must have thought it was a toxic reaction that I'd perhaps ingested something. So at least he's trying to nullify poison if I'd ingested it through milk. Very wise. I said, look, it's in my blood. It's not in my, it's not in my um, stomach. And I, and I sat there freezing to death thinking, oh, I can see his Mercedes Benz in the car park. So I turned to the owner who, who I knew owned it and said, sir, could you please take me in your, your car to the hospital now or I will die in front of you. He looked at his Mercedes Benz, put his hand on my shoulder and said, oh, my car? Oh, no, no, no. Cannot take my car. Sorry, white man. Don't worry. We wait for ambulance for you. I was by nature fairly laid back. I think I've smoked so much dope and pulled so many bongs and chillums in my time and smoked so much hash that it took a lot to get me really agitated. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, I'd been pushed out of a taxi. Now I've got some idiot who ain't take me in his car. I mean, I'm thinking, hit him. <laughs> My patience has run out. So um, Christians are taught to what? Turn the other cheek. Well, the non-Christian comes back with a baseball bat or a hockey. In Canada, you come out with a hockey puck. <laughs> and stick. And um, I was about to deck this guy, but as I try to hit him, to my fascination, my right hand wouldn't move. It was pat completely paralyzed. I thought, great, I can't even hit him. So I tried my left hand. There was a little bit of strength. I thought, well, I'm not a southpaw, but I could grab his shirt, pull him into my forehead and give him a headbutt and teach him a lesson humanity you'll never forget what not to do with a dying man. <laughs> it's amazing how angry you can get even though you're nearly dead. So anyhow, so I'm just about to rearrange his face and pull him into my skull. And I hear this audible man's voice. Well, for me, is audible. He said, son, if you hit him, the toxin is so close to your heart, the adrenal rush will kill you. I thought, shoot, that's S-H-O-O-T, if you just got the wrong accent. <laughs> Some people think it's a different pronunciation. I thought, who the heck is this voice? I don't know if you've ever seen two men trying to fight and someone try and break the fight up. Who gets hit first? <laughs> Usually the idiot who's trying to break the fight up. I don't know if you've ever seen two dogs, two dogs about a fight and go each other and someone tries to break it up. Who gets bit first? Well, I've just had someone broadside me 
and say, if you hit him, you will die right now. I thought, well, I could hit him and die and have the satisfaction that he's got no teeth because they'll be embedded in my skull. Or I could control my anger, look away and get him later. I thought plan B. So I looked away towards the swimming pool and thought, if I, if I survive this, your history, you better flip and hope I don't live because I'm going to sort you out, Jack. I couldn't even look at him because I'd have lost the plot and, and just whacked him. So as I'm looking to my right, controlling my anger, into the car park come the headlights of a Renault with, an, with the word ambulance. <laughs> As it comes flying into the car park, obviously the Frenchman is driving it, doesn't see anyone, and starts driving out. I thought, oh, dear God. My Creole friends who had rung the hospital uh, grabbed me, and I realised that my friend Danielle had rung the hospital. He grabs me with another security guard, and they are running with me. And then he realises the, the French driver is leaving town. <laughs> He jumps over. In Mauritius, they they concrete barbed wire and broken glass into the top of the walls in case someone tries to jump over and steal things. They have a little bit of a um, deterrent. <laughs> well, somehow Danielle had figured out how to negotiate a, a wall with broken glass and um, razor wire. He leaves this wall and nearly landed on top of this ambulance because the French driver is reversing quite quickly. <laughs> I'm being carried and dropped into this Renault and off we go. Um, the French driver hasn't asked, uh, how are you? Anything. He's just jumped it in gear and gone. I'm lying in this thing, freezing to death as the ambulance begins to climb the ridge towards Catrabon, the, the hospital. As my legs begin to elevate, the neurotoxin, which is in the lower part of my body, now begins to drain into my lungs, my heart, and my brain. I feel a wave of death literally envelop my entire being. I'm barely able to breathe, hardly able to keep my, myself conscious. Yet with my eyes opened, I begin to see like a video clip of a young child with snowy white hair. Um, I then see a teenage child, and I say, that's me. Then I begin to see my current life. I thought, my life has just flashed before me. This only happens, from what I know, just before you die. <laughs> not, not a great sign. So as I've just seen my life flash before me, I thought, am I, am I going to die? Um, I'd done veterinary science university as a consultant. I was a lifeguard. I thought, well, it doesn't look too good. My heart is nearly, I can hardly hear it. I'm, I'm totally paralyzed. I've gone through the death rattles and I'm completely dehydrated. Gosh, I may die en route to the hospital. As I lay there, I thought, well, if I did die before I even got there, is there life after death or is there nothing? I thought, well, I'm an atheist. Of course, there's nothing. The worms get you. Um, cessation of life. And you either get buried and the worms get you or they cremate you and a bunch of ashes. So my, my heathenistic, atheistic mind said nothing. But the gambling part of me said, you've been wrong before. So I was a gambling atheist. <laughs> so the atheist said nothing. The gambler said, you're wrong. You've been wrong, son. You how many have been wrong before? Any of you wonderful souls out there from Canada ever been wrong? Ever been wrong? No, you just one person put their hand up. So I thought, well, mate, I've been wrong a fair few times, and this is not the time to be wrong. I thought, well, I've heard lots of opinions. Buddhism, Taoism, humanism, Darwinism, Confucianism, you know what I mean? <laughs> There's a fair few of them. I thought, well, I want to back the horse that wins. I said, well, I have no idea if there's something out there. I'm just about to die. I'll soon find out if there's life after death. As I'm just had that thought and 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 I kind of resigned to the fact that I could die and we'll just see what happens. Unbeknown on the other side of the world, the only person in our family that was a Christian 
was my mother. Now, we had tried to convert her numbers of times to Darwinism and David Attenborough's um, concepts. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> Anyhow, I can't help it. Off. So yeah, I'm, I'm lying here dying going, well, <laughs> mum appears. Now, mother is the only Christian in the family. As mother appears, I see she's on her knees praying because she's a wonderful Anglican, high churched, and she used to pray every, every day for us. And... um I had no idea until I talked to her later. At the moment I'm seeing my life flash before me, my mother sees my face appear in front of her, and God says, your elder son, Ian, is nearly dead. Pray for him now. Mm. Well, the reason why any of us are even sitting here listening and talking on Zoom is because someone's prayed for us, a family member, a loved one, a grandparent, a neighbor, a work colleague. Mm. Someone's actually prayed for us. Well, thank God for prayer and thank God for a, a loving mother who believed in Christ against all the abuse that she got from her family members, trying to dissuade her from her her her, her belief in God. I'm lying watching mum praying. She looks up at me and she said, Ian, no matter how far from God you may be, son, no matter what you've done wrong in your life, if you call out to God from your heart, God will hear you. And God will forgive you some. It hit me like a ton of bricks. When I'd been confirmed at the age of 14, these are the words my mother had spoken to me when I walked away from my confirmation, having no experience and deciding never to come back to church. And as mum was weeping at a, when I was a 14-year-old boy, pleading with me to believe, she told me this incredible statement. No matter how far from God you may be, no matter what sins you've committed in your life, son, if you call out to him from where? Your heart. God Almighty will hear you and he will forgive you. Well, these words had resounded um, in my spirit. It had been 12 years since she had said it. I was now 26 years of age, no longer an innocent 14-year-old boy. And I lay there thinking, Mother, it's too late. I've committed so many sins. If there is a God, I'd be an absolute hypocrite asking him to forgive me. My mother said, son, pray, God will forgive you. So I thought, well, what prayer did my mother teach me? It's Christian. I thought, well, she taught me the Our Father's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer. I've got nothing to lose. So I began to try and pray, but my mind went completely blank. My mother said, Ian, don't pray from your heart, from your head, son. Pray from your heart. I thought, Mum, my heart's like stone. I'm so cynical. I'm so unbelieving. I said, but God, if you do exist, if you actually are real, if you see anything good in my heart, please help me to pray. I can't remember the simplest of Christian prayers, the Lord's Prayer. As I said those words from my heart, words appeared directly inside the ambulance in front of me like words of light. And the first words that came up, forgive me, forgive us our trespasses and sins. I thought, well, that is part of the prayer. It's not the beginning. I said, God, I don't know how it's possible to forgive all my sins. I certainly have no time to list them because there are too many. But if you can forgive me of all my sins, I sincerely ask you, Forgive me my sins now. As I said that, the words disappeared. Fresh words came up. Forgive those who have trespassed and sinned against you. I thought, forgive others. That's easy. I'm not vindictive. I'm not revengeful. Yeah, I can forgive anyone, God, no matter what they've done to me. I forgive those who have sinned against me. As I said that, the face of the East Indian taxi driver appeared a foot away from me. I thought, what the is he doing here? <laughs> and a voice said, would he forgive this Indian taxi driver for pushing you out of his car tonight and leaving you for dead? I thought, no, why should I? Suddenly the Chinese hotel owner appeared next to him. The voice said, 
will you forgive this man for, for not taking his car tonight and even for dead? I thought, actually, I was going to lay my hands upon them. <laughs> but it wasn't like the old vicar. Oh, God bless you, my son. You know, my hands are going to go around their throats. Have you got a problem breathing, Jack? Don't worry, be happy. So here I am. How many have prayed the Lord's Prayer? How many? Some of you must have. You're Canadian. Some of you must have prayed it somewhere along the line at school. Or in, well, I was a christened, confirmed Anglican sinner, mate. I'd pray that thing thousands of millions of times. The problem was, guess where it came from? Polly wanted a cracker. I'd prayed it from my head, meaningless repetition. Once late, when I read the Bible later, God said, men honor me with their lips. <laughs> this is what he called hypocrites. Men honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So I realized I had spoken these words, meaningless repetition, the words of the prayer, never united them with repentance in my heart and forgiveness. And so therefore God was now showing me my unforgiveness. Anyone on your hit list? <laughs> Maybe the next to you. Oh, no, the, the child got the one up. <laughs> it's, it's worse when you're in a church <laughs> the next year. Anyhow, so here I am. I've got a fair few on my hit list. Have you ever seen the Titanic? like a little bit above in the iceberg. Well, I thought these are the top of the pops, you know what I mean? The Chinese and Indian guy. But man, there's a fair few other men and women on this planet I'd love to sort out given half a chance. <laughs> so I realized, oh my God, I could be talking to God. How would you like to wake up and realize you actually audible, the audible voice is God and he's, he's trying to talk to you about your unforgiveness, your bitterness, your resentment and desire for payback to, you, to, to mankind. <laughs> it's a little bit different. <laughs> so my prayer suddenly took on a certain amount of um, significance. And I said, well, God, I don't want to forgive him. If that's you up there, why should I? Look what these mongrels did to me. Silence. No more prayer. I thought, well, that's not good. <laughs> the only way I'm going to get this prayer out is if I pray from my heart and actually forgive them. Man, could I do that? I thought, well, if God could forgive me, that would be an absolute miracle of the cesspool of sins that I've committed. Surely I could find enough compassion and mercy in my heart to forgive my fellow man. I thought, yep. Yeah. God, if you can forgive me of the stuff I've done, and there's a heap, then I will forgive these men. I'll never touch them. I'll never seek them out. I'll never harm them all the days of my life. As best I can, I forgive them and all those who have sinned against me. Immediately their faces disappeared. And God then had a sense of humor and then took me into Indian and Chinese as a missionary years later just to test whether they've sorted that out, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> he knows how to sort you out, mate. So here I am. Yeah, I forgive them, mate. So here I am. Next minute, fresh words come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, remember, Star Wars hadn't come out long galaxies, long time ago, far and some. Well, this was before when Star Wars came out and I saw them doing this. I thought, man, I've had this in an ambulance. <laughs> Thy will be done. I thought that's God's will. So far, I'm independent, self-sufficient, and proud of it. As Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. Well, I thought, whatever God's doing up in heaven, it got nothing to do with my lifestyle. And I thought, if I pray this from my heart, what the heck? That's a complete, that's admitting you're wrong. That's trying to find out what God's doing in heaven, heavenly stuff, and try and live it on earth. Well, that'll cramp your life, lifestyle somewhat. <laughs> Not exactly one hour on Sunday, stand up, sit down and kneel and say hallelujah. So I'm thinking this is a 24-7 prayer. Not some supermarket or food chain you have in the States. So I, well, you're in Canada, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Wash my mouth out. <laughs> so here I am. I'm lying here, dying. And I'm having to think, what is God's will? I said, I have no idea what he's doing in heaven. It's certainly got nothing to do with me down here on earth. I said, God, if you help me through this, I humble myself. I admit I'm wrong. I'll try and find out what you're doing in heaven and try and do the will of God here on earth. Next minute, the whole prayer came. Like the Star Wars thing. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As I read it through, I finished the prayer 
the ambulance slammed on its brakes as I arrived at the hospital. It seemed as though in that ambulance, time had gone into slow motion. And I've talked to tens of thousands of people who have died like me, and they all tell you in the last moments, everything goes into slow motion. Uh, even head-on collisions. One person said, oh, I was in, it's instantaneous. I said, no, no, it's like the matrix. God seems to slow time down. And I said to God later, why do you do that? He said, because I wish none to perish. I apply more mercy and grace in their dying moments than perhaps their entire life. I said, what? He said, Ian, I can speak to them like I was speaking to you in that ambulance. And he, he literally slowed time down for me to complete that prayer. As that prayer was finished, a peace entered me that has not left me in 40, it's nearly 42 years. And I knew I'd made peace with God. No one needed to tell me that I had made my peace with God. I knew that God had heard me. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding filled me the moment I prayed from my heart. Isn't that incredible? I had no idea what born again was. I had no idea what salvation was. I was an Anglican. I didn't know anything. As good as my Catholic friends. We, we, we knew how to stand up, sit down and kneel. We didn't know what we were doing. We went to church because mum and dad took us there. So, and I had all the certificates that I was christened and confirmed, sitting down with my stamp collection and my, and my marble collection. So here I am. I now found God. I thought, what an incredible thing to find God is real just before you die. I thought, I wonder how many men just like me pray and find him just like me. And I thought, what, what, what a bizarre thing. And, and next minute, the ambulance door swings open. I'm still kind of reeling with the fact that I've just met God. I've just found his peace. It's all so real and surreal. Yet I'm now shunted back into the reality of fighting for my life. As the ambulance driver lifts me into a wheelchair, he races me into the hospital. And like most hospitals, they have nurses taking your blood pressure, um, talking to you. They're all speaking in French. <laughs> My French is so un petit peu. It's like, you know what I mean? So they shove this thing on my arm. Nurse starts pumping it up. She gets a machine and shakes it. So what's wrong? She rips it off puts another machine on my arm, pumps it up, and then hits the glass where the mercury is supposed to move, then hits the top of it. I thought, what kind of hospital is this? <laughs> I thought, old oh, British Army stuff from World War II, man. I mean, that's the equipment they're using. I thought, but even blood pressure machines live the top. They, the, the, the mercury ain't going unless the thing's broken in the glass. What, they, what was happening, of course, was they couldn't find a pulse. So when you get close to death, your extremities shut down and the heart tries to keep the blood supply and oxygen supply to the brain. The extremities by this stage were in what the doctors and nurses call a crash mode. So they couldn't find a pulse. The ambulance driver realized the poor nurse had lost the plot, rips the thing off my arm, and then in the wheelchair races me straight through, which you never get in New Zealand hospitals, <laughs> I don't know about Canadian, but you never get to see a doctor for all. You could be five hours waiting. So he, this ambulance driver just raced me straight past all the nurses, all the orders, and straight into where the doctors were sitting. <laughs> well, the doctor's wondering, what's this guy doing? I don't even know if I can speak. I said, I've been stung by sock on visab jellyfish. I need antiserum now or I'll die in front of you. As these words are leaving my mouth, the poor nurse is running past me with two bits of paper, which I assume to be my blood pressure. <laughs> whatever she, whatever is written on those two bits of paper, that 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 doctor, and he was old, <laughs> jumped out of his seat. His young doctor jumped, and these two young Indian doc, well, the old Indian doctor spoke in perfect Oxford English because he mostly did his medical degree there. He said, son, I'm going to try and save your life. Keep your eyes open. He then grabbed the wheelchair, raced me down the corridor, 
and began to himself fill up the syringes, which I use on, we use on the farm for milk fever. I mean, these are horse syringes and started trying to jab them into me. I then had nurses, people, anti-serum, antitoxin, dextrose. As I smash in my hands, my veins won't come up. So they try and put a, a needle in, but my they can't get any fluid. So they inject and it moves to my wrists. Then the next one moves to, my, to just past it. And it's just sitting there. I'm looking at it, wondering why isn't it moving? And the doctor's looking at it going, and the nurse starts manually massaging it and it's rolling off her thumb and forefinger. And I'm thinking, that's not good. Nothing's moving. I can feel myself beginning to leave my body. The old doctor said, son, we've done this. All we can do for you, you must keep your eyes open or you will die. Well, I'd heard that back on the beach seemingly half an hour ago. <laughs> I don't even know how, how I was still alive. They didn't know how I was alive. God was keeping me alive. So they lifted me out of the wheelchair and put me on a bed. And I I could hardly breathe. Perspiration from the dextrose that they put in was causing fluid to return to my body and was forming beads upon my forehead and draining to my eye sockets. And I couldn't see. So I tried to speak, doctor, please wipe my forehead. I want to stay alive, but my lips wouldn't move. I tried to lift both hands to lift them just to clear my eyes. Both arms were completely paralyzed. I thought, tilt your head in. You've got to keep your eye open. So I tried to tilt my head. My head wouldn't move. I mean, no, this doesn't look good. <laughs> eyelids, squeeze your eyelids, try and squeeze the fluid out, but... You know how your eyes go all blurry when they've got liquid in it? Couldn't squeeze my eyes much. As I, as I did, they got heavier and heavier. I thought, stuff it. I've got to take a break. I'll do a power nap. How many have ever done a power nap? You're just going to go for sleep for five minutes, and sure enough, I'll be a box of birds when I wake up. Well, I closed my eyes, and the moment I did that, the machines monitoring my vital signs flatlined. And... Um, I was pronounced dead. For me, in the midst of this, I didn't hear them say the boy's dead. I heard the machines go off. And in a second, I was out of my body. I don't know if you've ever heard of people looking down on their body, so like eight to 10 feet above, um, and they can tell and see everything that's going on. And, and some of them, they're right on the edge. The, the scriptures say when a man dies, his spirit leaves his body. So it's pretty obvious that the body is ash and dust, a clay vessel. So in a split second, my spirit left my body. Um, but I wasn't, I couldn't hear the doctor say he's dead. So <laughs> I was very much alive. And within a second, I was out of this world in a realm of, in a realm of complete darkness where I'd been lying down. I was now upright. I thought to myself, did I just die? Or have I been asleep? You know how you can be asleep for, for five minutes and it actually could be five hours? Have you had that kind of encounter? Um, so suddenly time became a bit weird. Was, was I asleep for a few seconds or was I have I had a deep sleep and have now woken up in, in the dark? Well, I was disorientated. I, I'm standing. It's pitch black. Well, I thought, well, let your pupils adjust to the dark. So I turned around 360, looking for my eyes to adjust. Nothing. I thought, that's unusual. I thought, well, then don't panic. Find the, find the wall and, and turn the light switch on. So I groped out to my right. I don't know if you've ever slept at a friend's place and tried to find the light switch. Mm -hmm. How many have figured out the best thing to do is put your foot in front of you and your hand in case you go down a stairwell, trip over something. And so I'm groping out maybe 10, 15 feet, no wall. It's weird. So I go back thinking, well, obviously I'm in the, they're moving into the, into the general ward. I'm, my hospital bed, there should be a lamp near it. Just got to find my bed. So I go back to my left, groping around. Oh, now you've lost your bed, you idiot. How on earth did you do that? 
So I then do bigger concentric circles, trying to touch a table, a bed, a couch, anything. I thought, I can't find a thing. I thought, well, it's so dark, you can't see your hand in front of your face. So I bring my right hand towards my face and my hand passes straight through it. I thought, you can't miss your head. Two hands, not that dark. Both hands go straight through my head. It feels it is. But when I go to touch it, there's nothing there. So I go for my chest. You can't miss that. How many know you can't miss your chest? Some of some of the six packs have become kegs now. So I went, it's a great restaurant, actually, the keg. So I went for my chest, and my hands went straight through my chest. I thought, where are my hands? Both hands through each other. How many would find that a little bit unnerving? Can't touch this. <laughs> so I'm, I don't touch nothing. I'm thinking, how can a man feel he's there, but when he goes to touch it, there's absolutely nothing. Then I remembered my grandfather had fought in two world wars, and during the war, men had lost limbs and arms. And when you, my grandfather said, when you talk to these men, and I'd visited some of them after the war following him, like a little hush puppy following grandfather, and some of these men said, oh, scratch my foot, Sonny. Oh, well, there's no leg there. And my grandfather proceeded to tell me that they could feel the limb was there, but when, but it wasn't. And this is a very common occurrence among soldiers. And my grandfather fought in Gallipoli and fought against Rommel and al Alamein. So two terrible battles and survived them. And so he, he was a man who would very rarely talk much about the war, like many of the soldiers. But this is one thing I gleaned from him, that men could feel their limb in, even though it was there. I thought, well, I wonder what it's like to lose your entire body <laughs> and still feel it's there. So I'm, the, I'm I'm contemplating, well, I could actually be dead but alive. My physical body could be back in the hospital. Where on earth am I? Then become acutely aware that this darkness had a spiritual component. It wasn't just physical darkness, which we could handle. There was a cold, evil presence, so powerful that you could feel like you could cut it with a knife and it would weigh something. I had been in some pretty dark... Um, company and been some pretty dark regions of my life and I had sensed the presence of raw evil but if you want to magnify this kind of 10,000 times it was like the entire atmosphere is permeated with evil and um, I'd never read a bible but of course the bible tells us that there are two kingdoms a spirit of darkness ruled by satan and a kingdom of light ruled by jesus and Acts 26, verse 18. Well, I'm standing in the kingdom of darkness, and I then hear men from the darkness scream at me. The first man said, shut up. I thought, shut up. I've said nothing. Not realizing that my, I think the Lord said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So my thoughts, my inner, inner thoughts are from my heart could be hurt as, as if I was speaking. Like, where am I? Well, they knew exactly where I, where I was. The next man said, you deserve to be here. I said, deserve to be where? Another man, you're in hell. Now shut up. I said, I don't believe in hell. And if this is hell, where's the party place? So my world was if there was a hell, such a thing, it could be an Ibiza mosh party or an MTV, you know, I, yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. So here I am. I'm thinking, this is supposed to be sex, drugs, and rock and roll. More wine, more woman, Harley Davidsons. I mean, it's all on down here. Everything you can't do on this earth, you possibly can do here. And no one's going to get into your face because it's just one big cesspool of party time. Well, very hard to grab a beer when firstly you couldn't grab the bottle and you couldn't find your face. How many find that a problem? <laughs> you Canadians don't drink beer anyhow. So have sex. Well, very hard to have sex when you've got no physical form. Very hard to take drugs. Can't See, I'm standing here going, oh, well, if it's not a party place, which is what the heathen think it is, they the, the Christians have told me it's a place of hell, fire and brimstone, rotting corpses, maggots and, and demons with horns, little tails and red jumpsuits, prodding you with trident pitchforks. 
putting another one on the rotisserie, on the barbie tonight. So I'm going, well, where's the demons? Where's the rotting corpses? Where's the fire cooking up all these rotten sinners? Well, I mean, it's the complete darkness. I'm thinking there's no rotting corpses here. Those rotting corpses are back in where they died, either on the head-on collision on their motorbike or, like me, lying in a hospital. So this isn't the physical place. So firstly, you can't have roasting, rotting, and there's no... If you, if you have a physical body, it gives off a stench and you can invite flies and maggots. Well, there's no physical body. It's a spiritual body. And then I'm thinking, well, where's the fire? I had no idea the Bible says that death and Hades, or, or this place of darkness, is held until the day of judgment when it is cast into a lake of fire. When Christ returns and then those that are cast into the lake of fire are then Tormented. Does it make sense and consumed? And and that Satan actually hates the fire. He's terrified of it because God's an all-consuming fire. Jesus' eyes are a flame of fire. When Elijah prayed, fire and brimstone didn't come from hell. It came from heaven and consumed Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'm getting a, a download of a hell different from what my upbringing had been. Does that make any sense, my traditional Christian upbringing? So... And if you read Galatians, Paul talks about the fruit of the flesh. The fruit of the flesh are immorality, drunkenness, idolatry, adulteries. These are desires of a man's heart. Um, and when it says the worm cannot devour the flesh, you're talking about the desires. They cannot be fulfilled. In other words, it's a, a parable or it's or it's a, um, what do you call this, a, a name for it? Um, simile. It's like a metaphor. So a lot of the scriptures that the Lord talks about are metaphoric or in a parable. So I'm suddenly realizing that I could be held in this darkness. In fact, the Bible says that you're held in chains of darkness, not literal chains, but you're held in the kingdom of darkness until the day of judgment. Does it make any sense to you? Mm -hmm. None of you. You're all looking dumbfounded, <laughs> blinded by the light. So here I am. I'm walking. Where am I walking in Hades? Well, thank God, Psalm 23 says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? Death, I shall fear no evil. Who do you think was walking with me? No one knows. Okay, thank God it was Jesus. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Praise God, we got someone. You got with someone, right? <laughs> so who had I made Lord and shepherd of my soul, my spirit, just before I died? Yeah. Jesus. What prayer had I prayed? Prayer. The Lord's, Lord's prayer. prayer. What was the Lord's prayer? One of the most powerful salvation prayers given to mankind, isn't it? Yeah. So who had I prayed to? The, the Our Father's prayer. I had surrendered my life to the Lordship of who? Christ. The Lord, my shepherd of my soul, was leading me through where? Yeah. The valley of the shadow of death. Could evil touch me? The Bible says no. Greater is he within me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Can life, death, principality, power, plague, famine, the sword. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Isn't that exciting to know, folks? Mm -hmm. But I believe most Christians don't even get to see this. They just go straight into the light. <laughs> but thank God I got saved. You know the thief on the cross? One of them went down and the other one got saved in but didn't he? In a deathbed prayer. Lord, yeah. remember me. <laughs> and what did Jesus say? Today you shall be with me in paradise. How would you like to be that one? Last minute prayer, last second. <laughs> Please remember me. He didn't even get the sinner's prayer right. How many know sometimes we don't even get the prayer right, but God sees our heart. Come on. You don't have to get all the theology right you just got to say god looks at the heart and if you humble yourself he sees it doesn't he yeah. he sees the repentance and the conviction in your heart says god bottles up your tears and he's wanting to save so here I'm in this extraordinary darkness, and I tell you what, it's 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 frightening. You wouldn't want your worst enemy to go there. 
you don't want anyone to go there. I tell you what, this this has impacted me so much. Some people say, oh, no one's going to hell. Yes, they are. And that place will not stay empty. That will eventually be emptied into a lake of fire. Nothing about this gets good. <laughs> so I lay, I, I stood there surrounded by evil, yet had an incredible peace within me because the Prince of Peace within me and this radiant light pierced through the darkness. How many have read in Isaiah, those walking in darkness have seen a great light? Light shines in the darkness and the darkness flees. What struck me was this light just, just touched me. It didn't touch anyone else in the darkness. And there were other men, of course. It just touched me. As it touched me, my entire being felt weightless. And I began to lift up into this radiant, pure white light. How many be very happy about this point? Yeah. <laughs> Who holds the keys of death in Hades? Right. Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, where did he go for three days and three nights? To hell. That's right. And he took back from Lucifer the keys of death in Hades. And thank God he has power over death. Thank God he's power over hell. As I'm being drawn up into this light, I am captivated by the radiance. And I'm thinking, is this real? It's just out of this world. So I look back. As I look back, I had a Sunday school memory of Lot's wife looking back after the angel had delivered them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. How many have ever heard that story? Anyone? What happened to that dear woman? She turned, she turned into salt. salt. She turned into a pillar of salt. She was instantly destroyed. I'm now being drawn up into this light, and I have the memory of a Sunday school story from my Anglican church of the wife turned into a pillar of salt looking back. How many know that might get you? <laughs> the scriptures say, fix your eyes upon who? Jesus. <laughs> How many heard it's a small and narrow way and few find it? Well, I am, it's like beam me up, Scotty. The closest I could think was Star Trek in those mm -hmm. years. So I'm coming up into this light thinking, son, don't look back. What if you do? Don't look back. As I've been drawn up, I can see an opening, circular in shape. I'm drawn into this opening, and I realize it is a long, narrow tunnel. And I think John 14, verse 3, Jesus said, uh, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And small and narrow is the way that leads to the kingdom of God. Few find it, most find what the broad way that leads to destruction so I found it very easy to fall in the darkness, but there was only a very narrow passageway leading into the kingdom of light. As I'm looking at it, I can see that the tunnel isn't the source. That the light is a kingdom of light at the very end of the tunnel. As a surfer, uh, we're always looking for the barrel. We're always looking to try and get in the tube. And you see light out of this beautiful um, curtain. And you try and surf into it. And I think in the natural, it's the closest it counted on earth to coming into the tunnel of light that leads into the kingdom of heaven. And as I'm being drawn at the speed of light through this tunnel of light, waves of radiance come up as if to greet me. And when you're in an ocean, you see waves of foamy white that wash over you in the ocean. It was like a wave of pure white radiance washed over me as I was entering the tunnel. This wave of light gave off a living emotion that I call comfort. In fact, the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. How many have felt comforted when you got saved? You just, you bawl your eyes out, you weep, and you don't know what to do, but you feel a warm comfort. <laughs> a bit better than Southern comfort <laughs> and a few other false comforts that we've all tried at different times. So this comfort hit me. And then my entire feeling was as though someone had just embraced me and held me. I thought, that's a living light. It has the intensity of laser light, but I felt an emotion. I move further down, another wave of light hits me, and I feel total peace from the tip of my head to the base of my feet. And of course, Jesus said, I am the Prince of Peace. Peace I give you, not of this world. And this peace has not left me in 42 years. Mm -hmm. As this peace flooded me, I thought, 
In the darkness, I couldn't see my hand. I wonder if I can see what I look like in the light. So I turned my head to the right, and here was my hand outstretched. And as I brought it up to my face, I could see that it was my hand and my fingers and arm, but instead of flesh and blood and bone, it was a transparent spirit-like being. In fact, the Bible says, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God, but we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Mortality will take on immortality, first the natural, then the heavenly, first the earthly, then the spiritual. So I could actually see what men who've had amputations can feel. They can feel their spiritual bodies. How many realize that you're more real inside you, your spirit body is more real than your physical body? Mm -hmm. You feel like you can live forever. You can, but your body is packing up. How many of the older gentlemen... Folks that have feel that the thing's packing is sad and there's a few replacements needed. Well, here I'm a young 26-year-old man. I don't think anything needs to be replaced, but I've just had a complete download as I am lifting my hand up, now knowing why I can go through my face. Here I am, a spiritual being of light. The Bible says God is the father of light and we shall become sons and daughters of light. How many would be happy about this point that you're a, it's you? <laughs> you can see you, but how many know that we get a new body? How many would like to get the new body? Some of the older ones are going, yep, we would like that old, that one, yep. <laughs> so, 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 I haven't got my new body yet. Does this make sense? How many know this? I, I am seeing my spiritual being, oh, unbelievable, which is more real than my physical body, and I'm looking at it. That's extraordinary. I thought, I don't want to stop here. I want to see more. What on earth is at the end of this tunnel? I move further down. Another wave of light hits me. I'm enveloped in joy and excitement and expectation that what I'm going to see next will be the most awesome, incredible thing a human being could possibly encounter. I pop out of the um, tunnel. So how many have heard of the fruit of the spirit? Yeah. Comfort, peace, joy. How many have tasted that as Christians? Isn't that just not... A, the world doesn't get that kind of joy. The world doesn't get that kind of peace. They just don't get it. I didn't. And if you got it, it was fleeting moments. Well, this was just abiding in me. I come out of the tunnel, and I come into a kingdom of light. I realize the tunnel made it incredibly small. I'm now in a realm... My first impression, this must surely be the center of the universe. All life, all light, all power in the cosmos must originate from this focal point. What is it? Is this just an innate power in the cosmos? Or is there someone or something in this light? As I question it, immediately a person in that light responded, which answered my first question, <laughs> let the force be with you, or is there someone in there? Well, the person in there just said, Ian, do you wish to return? The moment I heard him, I thought, well, that answers the question. There is a, there's some being in there. But my next thought, how on earth did he know my name? And return where? And as I heard the voice, I realized it was the same voice that led me through the Lord's Prayer. Help you in the area of, if you close your eyes, you'll die. So I looked back. Directly behind me, and here is a tunnel going back into darkness. Sort of, I died, traveled through a kingdom of darkness, up a tunnel of light, and I'm standing out of my body before a being of light who knows my name and asks him if I want to go back into it. Or am I lying in what's called an NDE, which means I'm not dead, a near death experience? My mind has got starvation of oxygen. It has endorphins running, and I am tripping out of my skull, lying in a hospital bed in near-death situation. And all this is taking place in my mind. Do you understand that? Mm. So either I'm dead, out of my body, talking to a being of light, or I'm alive, and all this is taking place in what the doctors term a near-death experience. The reason why doctors have great difficulty enunciating the word life after death would mean that they'd have to get off their evolutionary um, uh, deception and actually realize there is life after death. And then they're going to have to look and say, 
what's out after death. So the best way they can do it when people are clinically dead is still call it a near-death experience because when they come back and talk to them, they said, oh, you were never really dead. It all took place in your head. Does that make... Trouble was, I was dead of neurotoxin. I'd been hit by a, by a semi-trailer and truck. I'm now alive talking to someone who's asking me. I said, look, if I'm dead out of my body, I, I wish to return. I have no idea where I am. He said, Ian, if you return, you must see in a new light. I thought, light? See the light. Are you the true light? He said, Ian, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. 1 John 1.5. As he as he spoke, the words appeared just like the Lord's Prayer as words of light. I think Psalm 109 says, His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The entry of his word brings light. And so his word was like words of light. God is light. And in him there's no darkness. I thought, well, this realm is pure light. Is that God in the middle of it? I didn't believe in God. But I also didn't believe in hell. <laughs> And there's no darkness in them. I've just come from a kingdom of darkness, and they call it hell. I thought hell was just to scare people into religion. The only people that are believers were terrified of going there. So I thought, well, I've just come from a darkness. This is pure light. Where is the darkness? I looked. I couldn't see it. I then looked behind me because when you – I'm looking at you now, and there's shadows all around you. Even though you are in a light, your body casts a shadow. So I looked behind where I was standing, and to my amazement, because I had no physical form, I was a spiritual being of light. The light was shining through me and casting no shadow. That's why the scriptures are true. There's no shadow or shifting in the Lord. Yet we often quote Psalm 91, in the shadow of his wings. Well, the reality is in the shadow of God's wings, there's no shadow. It's only pure light. Isn't that comforting? Mm -hmm. And there's no darkness and evil or malice within the, har the, car the heart or character or the person of God. He is completely separate from darkness. Well, I'm standing here going, if that's God, he knows my name. He knows my thought before I even speak. He must then see all my sin and everything I've done wrong. Mm -hmm. I've Someone up here has made a dreadful mistake and beamed the wrong person up. They pressed the wrong button. I should get the heck out of here, crawl under some rock, and go back into the pit of hell where I belong. So I began to move back from the light towards the darkness of the tunnel, um, wanting to go get away. The Bible says men hate coming to the light, least their evil deeds are exposed. Well, I knew that he could see everything. So as I moved back, waves of light emanated forth from him, and I was expecting this to be the wrath and the judgment and, and anger of God. But as it hit me, pure unconditional love hit me. Mm -hmm. Love? Why would God love me? My whole body tingled with this sensation of love and acceptance. I said, but God, surely you know my sins. And more love came. I thought, perhaps he's so old, he can't see. I thought the worst thing would be to come into heaven and have this old ancient God with white hair or something half blind, figure out that they've got the wrong man and chuck me out. Because I had this concept of some ancient of days person who perhaps didn't quite have it. So I'm I'm telling him, well, I've cursed you. I've broken your commandments. More love. I thought I perhaps need to be a bit more specific. I've slept around. I've done blah, blah, blah. I'm not telling you, you poor innocent Canadians. And so more love came. I thought, well, I'm going to tell them the sickest, most demented bondage thing I've ever been involved in. Even I can hardly believe I did it in my drunken out stupor. So I dropped the bomb of the worst, sickest, most demented evil thing I've ever done. And what was God's response? Pure unconditional love and acceptance. Well, at that point, I'd, I'd run out of sins <laughs> that were of anything really bad, and I began to burst into tears. I thought, I'm not crying. Men don't cry. I'm sobbing. Everything inside me is just bawling and weeping. And how many of when you got saved, you got buckets of snot and tears, and you'd, you're going, when does this thing stop? Well, I couldn't stop it. I'm bawling my eyes out. More love. I weep and have told God all my sin for He still loves me. And I've just done it. And you're weeping and howling away. 
I don't know if any of you have done that. If you haven't, you should, it's a good thing to do. And I'm howling away like a little kid, bawling, uh, couldn't stop bawling. And and the Lord speaks to me, said, Ian, in that, in that prayer, when you prayed the Lord's Prayer in the ambulance and asked forgiveness, I forgave all of your sins. Mm -hmm. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Though my sins are scarlet red, he washed them as white as snow. I'm standing here full of love, totally forgiven, full of peace, joy, comfort, <laughs> and surrounded by the presence of God's radiance and glory. How many have heard you're going to be changed from glory to glory? But all men fall short of his glory. Well, I could see the glory around God filled the heavens. The glory that was around me was like a firefly. It was like a glow worm. It was like a this little light of mine, <laughs> dear Lord. It was like I was a speck, <laughs> like a star standing before the sun. I was just overwhelmed by the enormity of the love. I thought all that light <laughs> is full of love. Somehow he has poured all that love and acceptance and forgiveness into me. I thought, what kind of grace is that? <laughs> I'd sung Amazing Grace as a drunken teenager on a New Year's party. Well, I suddenly knew what the amazing grace of God was. I knew what John Newton had sung, how sweet the sound mm -hmm. saved us, saved us, a sinner like me. And when I've been there 10,000 years, no, you know, and the brightness that, he, that John Newton talks about, he must have seen it. John Newton had to have encountered this as a slave, a captain, a, a butcher. He must have encountered God like this because no one could sing that without encountering the glory of God and the love of God. I am weeping, howling. I said, God, could I come into this light and radiance and see you face to face? I am so close. If I can see you, I can truly put a name to God. I will never need to ask another human being on the planet who God is. So I stepped into the light. As I did, the light healed my broken heart. It went deeper than I've ever felt any human being, any family member, any wife, mother, best friend. I think Jesus said when he, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him to heal the broken hearts. My broken heart that had been looking for love and only found lust and passion and 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 tor torment and 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 guilty conscience. His presence touched my heart of hearts, and and the inner inner presence of these veils, and they were literally like veils or stars. They began to minister deep into my my being. I thought, how can you cry and be happy? I'd never known that emotion. I was weeping with with incredible expectation of what God would look like. As suddenly as the the veils of radiance and glory began to part, and standing in front of me, I knew to be God. Mm. He was wearing robes of light, um, absolutely dazzling white robes, like a monk's robe, beautiful, deep folds. But they were made up of light. They weren't human cloth. They looked like human cloth. But when I looked at it, I could see he had made himself robes of light. Psalm 104, I think, verse 2 and 3. He's clothed himself in garments of light. His arms are outstretched with these beautiful deep robes uh, as if to welcome me. Hands of a human being, feet of a, of a man. As I looked to who was welcoming into his presence, I could see his hair was pure white down to his shoulders. But when I looked towards his face, the light, seven to ten times brighter, was emanating from the core of his face. So bright, I literally looked away, thinking it could only but destroy your face to look into that radiance. I realized it hadn't harmed my face as I looked, and that I could see that his entire countenance was ten times brighter than all the glory that surrounded him. Like the scriptures say, the Holy Spirit the third person of the Trinity glorifies the Son. But the Bible tells us that Jesus' face, when you've seen his face, you've seen the glory of the Father revealed in the face of Christ, that he literally is, his face shines like the sun in full strength, Revelations 1, 13 to 18. That is so bright, it would, I, I, I could imagine as I looked into this light, 
it was like looking into the cosmos. I could see that it was the face of God, the form of a man, but the face of God. And I knew if he spoke, galaxies, constellations would literally come forth from his from his from his face. It was like looking into eternity within eternity in his face. <laughs> I don't know. It's, you realize that God is taken on is a human form. Does it make any sense? <laughs> and I'm looking at a resurrected, glorified Jesus. Well, the Jesus I've seen in stained glass windows and in icons and in statues has brown hair looking like a hippie. This person, pure white hair. I have no reference from anything I've ever seen that Jesus' hair is pure white. The Revelation says his hair is white like wool, like snow. Daniel saw the Ancient of Days and his hair was white like wool. I don't think we had a peroxide blonde Jesus um, walking on planet Earth as the Son of Man. But as the glorified Son of God, this is what he looks like, like the Ancient of Days. I knew it was God. I'm, I'm, I'm going, it's not Jesus, but Jesus has brown hair. So I'm a little bit of a quandary. Who cares? That's God. His arms are outstretched. I'm getting closer. So, <laughs> I didn't know the Bible says when men saw this of old, they fell like dead men at his feet. You know what I mean? I was just like a dumb kid. I just walked towards him. <laughs> it's like a child walking towards the queen. If any human did it, they'd shoot him. But if it's a child, and there's like a little child, I was just going, here he is. Oh, my God. He's got his arms outstretched. He wants to give me a hug. Out of his countenance, radiant light hit me. This time, purity. I felt totally pure. Next minute, another wave of light, holiness. Two very abstract words. Who the heck is pure? Who is holy? <laughs> well, I am now. How many know that we are holy and pure because he is? So he had just transmitted purity and holiness into me, which I did not have. I had lost that innocence as a child, and I certainly was not living a holy, pure life. So thank God for all of us. God can fix us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can try, mate, but it's the Lord who's going to fix you. You fix your eyes upon him. You'll be changed from glory to glory. You'll be yeah. totally made pure and holy. It's just awesome. So, you know, I'm now right up next to him, captivated by the beauty. For a man to say that God was beautiful, I didn't have that vocabulary. It wasn't a gay bone in my body. So I'm just looking at him going, he's just I love everything about him. As I'm trying to see his eyes, and the Bible says, no man, you know, if you see his face, you don't live. <laughs> I realized if I'd seen Jesus' face unveiled at that point, I'd have had to stay there. Because Revelation 22, 5 says, we'll see him face to face in eternity. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, so Moses, Moses said, God spoke to Moses, you can see my form, you can see my glory, but my face you're not permitted to see, lest you die. So I'm now seeing his form, his glory. I'm trying to see his face, but I don't even know the Bible. Jesus steps aside so I don't see his face. Very gracious of him. <laughs> and right behind him, instead of actually um, pearly gates and fat little babies and people on clouds with white sheets firing arrows at each other, I stand there and I've got New Zealand in front of me. I've got untouched paradise. I've got fields, crystal clear rivers, streams, mountains, but nothing nothing of mankind, no houses, no buildings, um, nothing but untouched beauty. I'm going, this is like a Garden of Eden. This is like a brand new earth. What on earth is that? I thought when you go to heaven, you go up into these pearly gates and streets of gold and, and fat Italian babies with puffed up cheeks firing little things at you, Cupid arrows. What the heck's this? Well, the Bible actually tells us that God has created a new earth. How many have read that somewhere? And he said, I go and prepare a place for you. It says the old earth will pass away. How many have read that one? Second Peter 3, 10 to 18, with fire. Revelation says there's a new earth. How many like the new earth? Would that be a lot of nonsense? To say? Yeah. How many like a new body? How many like a new heaven? How many like a new Jerusalem? Well, the Lord says, I make all things new. You get the whole, you get the five lot, the whole lot. New body, new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, and um it's all. 
I am standing there looking and when you when I read C.S. Lewis's books later about Narnia, when they look through the cupboard, I'm standing in this doorway looking in. It's like a whole new universe, a parallel cosmos. I thought if I step in, I'm home. Why wasn't I born here in the first place? Well, you've got to be born again first. Mm -hmm. I was. And, and I'm just about to step in and Jesus comes right back in front of me. And how many heard he's the door? That no one comes in apart from him. There's no other person. There's no other name mm -hmm. given on heaven and earth by which you can be saved. People try and say there's heaps of different ways, but there isn't. So here, Jesus, the door of light, steps in front of me. He then asked me this pertinent question. Ian, now that you've seen this new earth, do you wish to remain here or do you wish to return? What would you do? Perhaps you come from White Rock, Langley. I don't know where you come from. Maybe Chilliwack. Perhaps you come from uh, Vancouver Island. Perhaps you're really from Steveston. I mean, goodness sake. You know, you're, you, where would you... Where, <laughs> sure. where Okanagan where which where would you want to be a new earth or this one and I look out this window and I go it's close to heaven on earth yeah that's pretty nice <laughs> I said I'm not going back to an apocalypse now world war three I'm gonna go back to hell on earth I want to step in and stay here he didn't move I thought well he needs more convincing <laughs> I said well I'm not married I have no children or none that I know of he still didn't move I said, I have no debt. There's nothing to go back for. He still didn't move. I said, well, no one loves me. I, I have no one to go back for. Let me in. <laughs> <laughs> he still didn't move. I thought, well, I'm I'm going to say, look back and say goodbye, cruel world. And then I'm in a, I know where he's standing. I'm going to dive to the right or the left. I'm a rugby player. And I knew if I just, I'm going to get in. <laughs> just to get it. So I look back. Goodbye, cruel world. Of Vita Zane. Ciao. Cheers. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll see you later. <laughs> As I look back, what does God show me? A vision of my mum. Yeah. One person yeah. who's back on earth that loves me. I love her and has prayed for me. Mm. How many be a little bit ashamed to say that no one loves you and your mother's right behind you? <laughs> well, it was a vision. It wasn't her because my mum's. So I and I thought, absolutely. If I if my mum has to bury my corpse or get a cremated jar of ashes from Mauritius, with a story, the boy died. Sorry, diving accident. I thought, what would do that, do that to my mother, who's a Christian? I thought it would devastate her. It would break her heart. She could hardly live with that. How could it be so selfish to come into heaven and think my mother would thought her son, for all intents and purposes, went to hell? No diary, no deathbed confession, no priest, no one. So I said, God, I have to go back for my mum. I've lived such a selfish life. I've been here once before. I'm, I'm sure you'll let me back here again. I was just checking. <laughs> I want to go back and tell my mother what she believes in is real. He said, Ian, if you return, you must see things in a new light from a heavenly, eternal perspective, not from a temporary, earthly one. I instantly understood what he was saying, to see through his eyes, no longer from a temporary, earthly, but from a heavenly perspective. Thank God we're, we're seated in heavenly places, mm. and, and God can help us see what really matters in eternity of our temporal life, which is like a flower of a field in the grass. One minute you're here, next minute you're gone. What eternal impact would you have? And I thought, so far, none. I've helped a few old ladies across the street. Mm -hmm. I've put money in the Red Cross. I've literally done nothing of any heavenly, eternal significance for 26 years on the planet. I've lived for me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. Let me know getting Christ in you and he, the, the eternal God, it should radically change your viewpoint of life. Yeah. Yeah. should you live differently one people said well if i died like you i would do it differently i said well the bible says that we no longer i that live but christ that lives in me mm -hmm. i said when you got baptized will you be baptized unto death mm -hmm. yeah. so i no longer live so why do you have to physically die to actually get the hold of the scriptures and actually live it mm -hmm. 
who do you live for? Most people just tack Jesus on. Oh, I've got Jesus. I've got my ticket to heaven. I'm just going to live as much as I can and push the grace of God as much as I can because I know he'll forgive me and I'll get there someday. Well, <laughs> no, no, I've just stood before him. I'm a dead man walking. It's no longer me. It's not my job, not my life. I'm to serve him, love him, and and bring some eternal significance on this planet. I'm a dead man walking. So I said to the Lord, I, I, don't, I understand what you're saying. How do I go back? So I look back, and next to my mother suddenly appeared my father, non-Christian, Freemason, my brother, my sister, and then like the Canadian geese flying a V formation, hundreds of thousands of people going off in the infinitum, literally behind my immediate family. I said, God, why are you showing me all these people? He said, Ian, most people won't step foot inside a church anymore to hear my name. So well, that's true. I wouldn't be sitting dead in the church. <laughs> I'd been there and done that, and most of them were dead. Even the people in there weren't even saved. So here I am. I'm looking at all these people. So well, I don't know them. I don't love them. He said, yeah, and I love them. I desire all of them to come to know me. I want you to go back and tell them what you've seen. I said, well, God, I love my mother. That's genuine. I certainly don't have a love for all of humanity, and certainly not for some of these people, because I know some of them. <laughs> I don't really have that in me. How do we know that God can change your heart and wreck you? Oh, yeah. right? It'd help you to forgive a lot of stuff. And the hardest ones are often the family. The in-laws, the outlaws, I mean, they can be more tougher than the complete heathen, mate. So I said, God, I have no idea how to love these people, but how do I go down the tunnel, back into darkness, into my body? He said, Ian, tilt your head. Feel the liquid drain from your eye. Now open your eye and see. I was suddenly back in the hospital, but no longer in the accident emergency ED. I was in the morgue on a slab, <laughs> oh. looking down the length of my body with a sheet up, and I got a doctor holding my foot in his left hand with a scalpel in his right hand, prodding what appears to be a dead piece of meat because I can't feel it. This poor doctor feels like someone's looking at him. It was me. <laughs> and he goes through the ceiling like he's just seen <laughs> corpse come back to life. Well, he had. Hmm. I'm thinking, what the heck's he doing my foot? Does he think I'm dead? And then I hear the voice of God say, son, I've just given your life back. Now, it would have been a lot easier if God had let me float down from heaven, down through the tunnel, back into the darkness, and slip back into the body. But no, he spoke like he did to Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. He has creative power and resurrection power to speak that which is dead back to life. He can even speak a nation's come into existence. He spoke, and I was back in my body, alive, with a man thinking I'm dead. This poor doctor goes through the ceiling, because I'm getting sick of looking at him, so I took my head to the left. When he sees my head go this way, boom, up he goes. Three nurses in the doorway, freaking out of their skull, falling over, bashing each other, and running, like they've just seen a corpse come back to life. Well, they had, but I didn't know that. I just saw them bolting. I thought, well, this isn't exactly a coma. They're obviously not treating me as if I've come back from a sleep. Yeah. They've done a runner. <laughs> I look back to the doctor. He's shaking like a leaf, holding my foot, holding it together. He drops my foot and thought, is he going to run? Then out of his mouth, he said, we've done nothing to bring you back to life. You've been dead for 15 to 20 minutes. What did you see? Huh. Well, I'm thinking, do I tell him that I've just seen heaven, hell, Jesus, the whole glory realm. I thought, well, I, I watched a movie by Jack Nicholson, one, one who flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. It's a classic, mate. <laughs> Jack Nicholson feigns to be a wacko nutter, locks himself in, and they throw the key away until some big Indian guy <laughs> gets him out. <laughs> Jack Nicholson does need help, actually. So here I am. I'm thinking of Jack Nicholson. And I thought, man, if I tell these guys, this doctor and these these people here that I've just seen God and he's white. They'll have me in a white room with a white jacket shooting me up with Prozac and I'll never I'll be sectioned. I'll never get out of here. Yeah. And God knew that. So I just said I said nothing. The poor man dropped my foot. They reattached my drip feed. I thought, oh my God, I potentially have just been dead for 15 to 20 minutes. Heck is all that about? Whoa, did, was that must have been real? Well, my head, my my, I said my world's going to change, my my whole. But I couldn't feel from my neck down. 
my whole body was still paralyzed. I thought, well, I could be brought back to life, be a vegetable on a machine. So I said, God, if I've been dead for 15 to 20 minutes, could you possibly heal my body so I can surf and live a normal life? If not, I'd rather be dead. Take me back to heaven. I don't want to lie here as a piece of meat on a thing going, I saw Jesus. Next minute, power moved through my body like electricity. For the next three or four hours, my entire body was healed. So I not only believe in resurrection power, I believe in the healing power of Christ. That healing miracles are for today, for now. Yeah. I've felt that power go through my body when I pray for people. I've seen them get out of wheelchairs. I've seen deaf ears open, blind eyes. I've seen people with cancers completely healed. I've seen quadriplegics get up and walk. So almost all the miracles in the Bible, except leprosy, because they haven't prayed for anyone with leprosy, I've seen. And, and that same power that healed me is out, available to every believer. You can lay hands on the sick and they're healed. So I, I walked out of the hospital. A fisherman thought I was a ghost, terrified, ran from me. Everyone thought I was a spirit. And um, I, I said, God, what's happened to me? He said, you're a reborn Christian. I said, what does that mean? you got to die? He said, no, read a Bible. I said, next to me, ask me to go to church. I haven't got a Bible. He said, your father's got one. And within six weeks, I read a Bible from Genesis to Revelations. Mm. And everything in there said, you must be born again. He said, you were born again through the Lord's Prayer. I said, what do I do now? He said, get baptized. I said, I had them sprinkle water on me when I was a kid. They said, no, no, you've got to repent first, then get baptized. I said, well, that does help. <laughs> so I got baptized in water, total immersion. And then it said, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I, I thought, what's all that about? So I had people praying for me. Then I said, God, I'm not sure about that. And so I, I said, if it's from you, everyone's trying to lay hands upon me. If it's from you, Lord, you'll do it. I'm out there milking the cows months later and singing away. Next minute, I start singing in tongues. I'm shut up, oh, What the heck is that? The cows looked at me. The dog looked at me. Everyone looked at me. I just got baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so I thought this is crazy, man. So I started. I thought I'll baptize the cow. No, no. <laughs> so I was praying for the praying for the cows. Cows got healed. I thought this is extraordinary. And within twelve months, God said, "Go out to the nations and preach the gospel." I'm finished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, it took so long. So long. Wonderful. Uh, oh, thank you. Amazing. We're going to get the gallery back on. Yeah, I'll do that. I can't. Any questions before we show? Because I'm sure it's too late. Uh, Herb said to go for at least two or three hours. <laughs> You're all that good. was amazing. Thank you so much. Buddy. I'm amazed at at how much you remember. Yes. Like this was 40, how many years ago? 1982. Yeah, 42. 42 years 40. ago. So the detail mm -hmm. of it it's a, it's a seems like it happened to you yesterday. When I was sharing tonight to, for us today, I started to see it again. Does that make sense? I try, God said, but the key is it's eternal, so you, it's outside of time. You can meet someone after 30 years and you haven't seen them since they were mm -hmm. high school, yeah. and you pick up exactly where you were at that time. So I find the Lord helps me to go back and relive it. Mm -hmm. I can't just speak it. I actually have to see <clears throat> it, feel it, and sense it. Sometimes I'm yeah. so weep. I'm so broken. <laughs> yeah, you you can see that that you're reliving it. Yeah, you know the emotion is there. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Because yeah. it hits me, and I stop. I I've sometimes can't even get going because it's hit me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and some people say, "Oh, you're lying. This is all in your brain." I said, "Whatever," but I know the encounter is as real today as it was then. And if mm -hmm. it was just a one-off encounter forty-two years ago, it'd be very sad Christianity. Thank God I have that encounter on a daily basis for the past forty mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. God's showing me more of the kingdom of heaven. God mm -hmm. speaks to me audibly in dreams, visions. God talks to me through the scriptures. God been doing that for 42 years it's not a one-off encounter it's a continual yeah. encounter with the holy spirit continual yeah. encounter with his person mm -hmm. and there's such a depth that's grown in me that i walk and live in him in him because we we have our being in him 
He's yes. so secure in that. I, I know he loves me. The, his love is, is beyond comprehension. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, still have feel start, you have to start as an alpha. You have to start as a beginner. Like me, I was an alpha. I knew nothing. I said, oh, someone should do, do an Omega course because because uh, <laughs> you know, alpha and Omega, beginning and end. I'd got it as a new kid, but I had, I'd had i seen the end. So I was really ahead of the game. I'd had the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Now you just got to live and walk out the sanctification, the ongoing repentance, <laughs> the ongoing <laughs> How many hate to do that? It'd be nice just to be suddenly perfect and wholly mature. It'd be wonderful, but you know, reality mm -hmm. is. <laughs> Are you still learning um, as you go thinking back to the experience and reading through scripture? Are there still moments that come back to you that all of a sudden click and make more sense? Oh, 100%. I think I got an advantage on revelation and the scripture ab above a lot of different people because I've already seen it. Does it make sense? So the scripture to me was just leaping uh, like alive. When I saw darkness, I understood. When I saw Hades, mm. I saw in heaven, the new earth, the throne room, so much of this stuff I'd encountered. Mm. And it made sense above many theologians who then argue the toss about oh my goodness sake some of the stuff we speak it's just i'm sorry it's just dribble and it's 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 all it's all fantasy land but you get people who believe they know everything about everything thank god we don't <laughs> thank god we're still learning uh, mm -hmm. i think the older i've got in christianity the more i realize i've got about maybe three sermons mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you've just heard one of them my testimony <laughs> and um yeah when you're young you think you know everything as you get older all you think is he loves me yeah yeah right. I love yeah. it's all good and you love others now. and you love <laughs> others well, because because that's the whole heart of god yeah. we love because he first loved us and God so loved the world, he came to save it. So if you want eternal fruit, a wise man wins souls. It's not not rocket science. <laughs> no. <laughs> if you freely yeah. receive it, freely give it. Yeah. I mean, thank God for people who've got a heart to evangelize. How will they hear unless someone tells them? I mean, I've spent 40 plus years, I've preached to anything, everyone. I'm a, I'm a walking track man and Robin. I've got I've got tapes. I'll I'll share the gospel anywhere. I'll I'll give someone never met before as much time as they want to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I'm storing eternal fruit. One guy said to me, "Man, what do you want?" I said, "Well, I I'm earning a hundred times what you're earning." He said, "Well, I'm on a hundred thousand bucks a year, mate." I said, "I'm on a hundred times that." <laughs> he said, "You're joking? What is it?" I said, "I preach the gospel and save souls." I said, I store my treasure in heaven. I said, yeah. I, I, he said, do you have a house? I said, no. He said, what do you have? I said, well, I have a car that's paid for and we rent. And <laughs> I said, but i got a house that's not here. It's been worked on right now. It's called a yeah. mansion in heaven. Amen. You're welcome to come visit any time. <laughs> it's got all the <laughs> decks and um, with a lot of rooms in that house for, for visitors. <laughs> And in my father's house, you won't be able to find the end of the mansion. <laughs> It'll be like Hotel California. It'll just keep going, right? <laughs> so, Ian, what did your mom say when it oh, all came out and you saw her again? Yes. She saw me reading the Bible, asked what happened. I told her. She burst into tears and told me how she'd been praying. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mom, your prayers were the key to me wow. praying. Had you not been praying? And God said to me, you might have 10,000 people wish that person dead, but there can only be one person praying. Who's God going to listen to? The person mm -hmm. praying. Yeah. And I've been to prisons. I've been into some of the maximum security prisons up in Route 66. And and I've seen men weeping, bawling their eyes out. Because why yeah. they they got praying mums, praying grandmothers. These are Hispanic boys. These are big black killers, you know, and they are on their knees. Weeping. Yeah. As their mum must have been, their mum or their grandma is praying when I'm preaching. 
because the yeah. Spirit of God hits the room and I see grown men come mm -hmm. up. <laughs> so it's real when we're prompted to pray because there's times, many times, you know, just all of a sudden someone will come to mind or something's laid on your heart and you're just thinking, you know, with wow. So that's a testament. That's a, that's proof. And people have been given that. The body is so beautiful. Some are intercessors. Some have got a power prophetic. Others have just stand the gap. And I found most women have an inbuilt thing for their kids. Mm. Um, men most can have a clue what's going on, but most of the women <laughs> really are in touch with the spirit for those kids. And they, their job is to pray as the Holy Spirit leads them. Others evangelize, others pastor, some teach, some prophesy, some are apostles. Thank God that there's ever, some just mercy ministry and helps. Just find out what you can do to help serve the body of Christ and each other to bring in the harvest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Simple. Really? Simple. <laughs> Hear God. I mean, have an encounter with God. If, you, if you're not hearing him and encountering him, I don't know what you're doing. It's whatever you're doing ain't working. <laughs> Mm -hmm. People say, "What?" I said, "Seek him." They, the apostles, and the they spent forty days up there waiting. Well, I mean, take some time, wait, fast, pray, dig a well, mm -hmm. do something, but get serious. If you people mm -hmm. say, "I want the instantaneous," no, no, there's a price behind the anointing. There's a price behind anything you do. There's a cost, and if someone says there isn't, then they're lying. Mm -hmm. It'll cost you everything. Yeah, it'll yeah. cost you everything. To the level that you're willing to commit and fully immerse yourself into God is the level that he'll meet you. Mm, yeah. There's a price. I could tell you the price and some of the names say, I don't want that. <laughs> I just got my ticket to heaven. That's good enough for me, Jack. See you later. I'm, I'm <laughs> gonna, I want the God bless me club for me. Well, that's wonderful. You'll have a boring Christian life and get to heaven. Then you get there, you'll actually have regrets of what you did in wasted years on planet Earth. Yeah. And you can't blame the pastor, the preacher, or the, the alpha course for actually not getting you motivated. <laughs> you, you've got to get motivated yourself. You've got to get the 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 desire and the heart and the passion. Yeah. 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 Pray for it. Get me on fire, God. Yeah. yeah. Eyes of the Lord look across the earth for a heart who's wholly devoted to him. Say, Lord, <laughs> my heart, get your eyes on me and help me. And he mm -hmm. will. Oh, he will. Yeah. That's why we we try to get together to do just that and to encourage each other in our walk with Christ, right? Yeah. We're seeking that out. And how do we how do we do that better, right? How do we how do we how do we know Christ more yeah. each day, right? And Canadians are, are great peacemakers, but they've got to go to war. Yeah. And our war is not against flesh and blood, it's against the powers of darkness. Oh. We need to really start praying and deceiving for breakthrough and for fires to start mm -hmm. people's hearts. And and yeah. when that happens, um, Canadians are going to be absolute world changers. The Holy Spirit has fallen on that nation numbers of times. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can go to the nations with it, touch the world. Mm. Yeah. Or go across uh, the, yeah. the neighbor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a good start. Uh, yeah. We need yeah. to get you. Awesome. Oh. Sorry, Melissa. I wanted to ask you, Ian, because both you and Jane have had a really challenging year. Yes. In different ways. <laughs> um, <I'm here>. yeah. <laughs> and, and in that uncertainty and in those hard times where you just are, you know, overwhelmed. Totally and peace. Totally you peace. felt peace? Oh, 100%. If Jane was, her heart, we, she was nearly dead when we discovered it. And um, it was the Lord by miraculous that actually found Jane's heart was nearly gone. And I mean, there's so much, but through the whole time, peace, because if to live is Christ, to die is gain. So there's no fear of death in Jane or myself. And if it's not our time, then God's going to do a miracle and he's going to keep her alive. Mm -hmm. I had a heart attack. The doctor kicked me out after seven hours saying, no, no, it's just chest pain from fishing. <laughs> 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 Take a Voltara, you'll be good. I go, you know, I feel like a ton of bricks are sitting on me. I go back and they sit for five hours waiting for someone to see me. Stand up and have a massive heart attack in front of the young English doctor who discharged me seven hours before with heart with chest skeletal chest cartilage pain. 
and I had a major heart attack and dropped me like a sack of spuds. My heart stopped. I basically died for a split second, and but God obviously knew it wasn't the time, and here I am again, seated <laughs> up and ready to go. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, if God's not going to do the miracle, then they use a doctor to do a miracle. The doctors right. don't go to heaven, get a new body. It's all good. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Not an ounce of fear. I don't have an ounce of fear. Jane came out worshiping the Lord, and the doctors who who operated on her thought, "Is that the is that the uh, the drugs we're giving for pain?" I said, "No, that's <laughs> like worshiping God." <laughs> she had her hands up. She's not supposed to do that. Her hands up, singing the way. <laughs> tubes and wires and oh goodness sake it looked like one of these movies that they have on star trek where they become cyborgs or something my poor wife's got all this and she's just singing i wish we got <laughs> oh no well, there he is she is that's it she's she's really sad and worried you know she's troubled i can see that but it's amazing what you know, i i remember looking at him and it was just like from inside you know it was like something just rose up and i remember all i all i could say was <laughs> life and not death you know Jesus what i mean i felt like i was just speaking it right into his his person and over the, and over yeah. life and not mm. death you know and, and you know how when you know each other so well like you I can connect see. I can with see. your eyes in a moment uh, and she didn't want me to go you dare go i could see she was quite she was quite adamant that i wasn't going the doctor said use you you want us to bring you back? And I'm thinking, yeah, no, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> He's going, oh, you're not. He's climbing over top of the in Jesus' name. And I'm going, listen to my wife. I don't think you, you better have, if you do lose me, you better have another crack at it, you know? But it's funny. I, I mean, I know the day will come when it is time, That's right. right? And I think I'll have a, a total peace and it will be like, okay, I'll know I've got to let, let him go, go or maybe I go first. But mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There's totally... Mm -hmm. It's not a forever thing, right? I'll see you yeah, again. See you on the other side. But it's like somehow I just knew now was not the time. So yeah. then in spirit, you fight, don't you? Or you hang on. Oh, yeah, you, you it's, battle. It's real. But there's a peace. You're battling from a place yeah, of rest and it peace. It wasn't a it wasn't a it's not fear. freak out. Like I was scared of him dying. Was I was quite like, happy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're more you're, you're you're more famous when you're dead, and they can watch the video on YouTube. <laughs> oh, well, really, honestly, at the end of the day, who cares? I mean, I'm I'm on the other side of the bell shaped curve. Some of you people are young and full of. I mean, go out there and go get the world saved, man. I'm I'm over here. I'm nearly seventy. Just get going. Fire up. Get the cylinders going. Reach. Take them back. Grab the fire and go for it. <laughs> when I was your age, I was out there trying to save the planet. <laughs> you can see some of you got the call of God on your life. You got the you got the hunger, you got the fire there. Don't mess with it. Go for it. Well, every everyone does in the sense that the ultimate is knowing him, isn't it? At the end of the day, he's the prize. He's the yeah. yeah. He's worth it. Do what he says. <laughs> And find out what that is. Yeah. And that could be Judea, Samaria, the romantic part. Could be your neighbor, could be across the road. But actually, do actually try and do something. It would be yeah, really exactly. helpful. Exactly. Don't just sit there selfishly. I've got it. I'm happy. I'm sweet. Sort yeah. my life out. Well, then help others. Mm -hmm. It's a servant mm -hmm. leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think if you start giving out, if you don't, you become like the Dead Sea, fresh water coming in from the Jordan. Mm -hmm. And you've got no outlet, you become a stagnant dead sea. And that is exactly what the dead sea is. Living water from the Jordan comes into it, and there's no mm -hmm. outlet. So you need to have an outlet. Find an outlet where you can bless, where you can give. And it's more blessed to give anyhow. I mean, you you just get so excited giving to others. It's just you you, you come alive. Yeah. I love giving fish to people. I even love giving the rod to herbs. Yeah. <laughs> He can pull the fish in and I can video. You know. And you can certainly <laughs> never outgive God. No, the cost you can't. is real. The cost is everything. <laughs> right.
<laughs> I love saving no catching much fish. You give, you should... <laughs> so fish. when are you guys coming to Canada then? Yes. Well, when... well it was supposed to be. We're supposed to be now. There now. It was supposed to be. I now. know. But when are you going to come? <laughs> it's well, hopefully next year. The Lord willing, hopefully next year. Hopefully soon. Okay. Yeah. We'd love to have you at Village and um, to be able to share your testimony again with a wider audience would be incredible, I think. Yeah. Okay. We should make it happen. I'll go from one to, to right. however, however many. <laughs> And what's yeah. so amazing through COVID, I love COVID because we didn't, we just walked the beach and and um, there were no cars. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk in a cycle, it's like the apocalypse. But yeah, I think what's happened with COVID is that it's it's helped us be able to do this kind of stuff mm -hmm. with Zoom. Yeah. I think you can touch more people. I'm going to do do one soon with in May with with France. There's five hundred thousand half a million people on there uh, that watch their stuff. And they've asked me to do it in French. So, I mean, yeah. I'm happy because I don't even have to leave town. I can share <laughs> the people in France, yeah. Canada, uh, UK, the yeah. States, did stuff with uh, in the States, and I've reached a couple of million mm -hmm. people. You just don't know. So, yeah. you... That's great for getting the message out, but there's something really precious and powerful about meeting together like you guys do. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing can with community yeah. and being accountable and... Um, yeah, we, encouraging we couldn't wait to give people interest. physical hugs and actually yeah. share a meal mm -hmm. and have normal life i mean mm -hmm. others were trying to walk around with masks you couldn't even give them a kiss you know you couldn't give them anything <laughs> <laughs> so thank god we can actually and hug pray yeah. press the flesh and <laughs> and um be real that's a, mm -hmm. do it while you can and and thank god we still can the days yeah. may come where we can't so yeah. enjoy the fellowship when you've got it. Yeah. Other persecuted mm -hmm. countries just don't have that. That's right. Yeah. Some people what are... is your website, Ian? Like if to look at to Deep follow you and help. it uh where's uh Courtney? Paul's are right there. You where's to where's, Braden where's Braden? His wife is Courtney's Courtney. Courtney. in the middle there. Well, wait, wait, there you are. that's his wife. But um, my website needs a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> is very willing to help so he's been working so, so on it. it's about 40 years out of date but anyhow the heart of it is to try and get it fixed up and paul's often he's offered to help um well, doctor it up and but it's called a glimpse of eternity so right now it's a it's a pretty old billboard and half the links don't work because I just haven't bothered. I've been fishing for too many years. I can see everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a chance to. And Vimeo and Google have wiped my my website out. I don't know how many times. Mm. I've had them. There's a spider on the web, and it loves to destroy Christian web stuff. So uh, mm. the, the bulk of it's up there. And whenever it gets wiped out, because they don't put any royalties or any any um, copyright on it, someone else has loaded it up onto their so I, I sometimes have to search to see where the the message or the my mum speaking or you know the Creole fisherman. I got to find out where it's been loaded up again. And uh, sure enough, someone else has reloaded that test me up. I think I had seventy five million until Google wiped everything out. Um, yeah. Hits on the website, and then um, it's starting to rebuild again. But most people try and sell things and flog stuff off. Well, Jesus said, freely receive, freely give. So I don't make any money off anything. It's all all the teaching, all the testimony, all the preaching. It's all free. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. I put the link to Ian's site on the initial email. There was a, a link to it, but we can always send oh. it. Yeah, Thank I've you. got it here. There's a YouTube. Oh, there's the other. There's your looks like a website mm -hmm. it looks like <laughs> it's like it's like a website. no no it's a link i think it's the website there's a whole lot of photos of just fishing <laughs> there were vegetarians getting all upset that i got fishing photographs on my website i said goodness i'll put some deer and wild pork up there too <laughs> anyhow i'm sure i'll put my foot in my mouth if i speak any longer so my wife's already kicking me, so God bless you all. <laughs> I, uh, I wonder whether you would. I wonder whether you would just pray for the group and yes. just that we all encounter, you know, the Holy Spirit in a real way tonight. Would you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
The Lord, we thank you that you love us more than anyone else on this planet. And, and Lord, your love is e eternal. Mm -hmm. Your love is the Father's love. It's um, cast it all fear. So we pray that your love would <clears throat> come down in a tangible way, mm -hmm. uh, the, the fruit of your spirit, the tangible presence of God, like a cloud, like oil, like wind, it just the warmth of your presence would just flood every single person from the tip of their head to the base of their feet. We thank you that you want to change us from glory to glory and that your glory, you actually said that you will change us mm -hmm. and you'll change us on the inner man. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing that yeah. our spirit, we're sons and daughters of light, can experience the presence of God. Yeah. It surpasses knowledge. It's, a, it's, a, it's so deep. Deep pulls under deep. Let the depth of your spirit touch every member, every person uh, of this world. And for even those who will listen to it, Lord, later, we pray that you just encourage them, strengthen them in their faith, build them up in love, that they'd be rooted and grounded in love. Mm -hmm. And, Lord, that love that surpasses knowledge, that would go so deep, fear of the Lord would become the beginning of wisdom for them, and that your purity and holiness would be imparted into them. We pray for open heaven. We pray for encounter, dreams, vision, audible voice. We pray the scriptures will come so alive that yeah. by personal revelation, it would leap out, out of them and they would become yeah. living epistles. We pray, Father, yeah. that you'd take them way beyond anything they've even hoped and prayed for. Mm -hmm. it would be like Song of Solomon, the seal of God upon them. Yes. Like it's like fire. It's stronger yeah. than that you would mark them wholly unto the Lord yeah. and that they'd be set apart even from this day mm -hmm. and they would look at the eternal things. they start seeing through your eyes, not through their own earthly eyes, but through the eyes of the of the of of Jesus himself and from the Father. I pray blessing. Mm -hmm. I pray, yeah. Lord, that the light of your countenance would rise upon them mm -hmm. and that your peace would go with them, mm -hmm. that you would go before them. Mm -hmm. And let many doors open. It's the door, it's the Jewish year of the door. We pray open, open heaven, open to the glory realm, open to encounter. Close the doors that need to be closed. Close those of, of past things that need to be shut, but open up expectation and a desire for the presence and throne room of God Amen. in Jesus. Yeah. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Love you Thank guys. You. Thanks, Thanks Hope and Alan. Back.